Those of you out there with quiet voices that feel like they get a little bit lost in the crowd sometimes will probably appreciate the fact that I have tried recording this intro many times this morning and every time it's just lawnmowers and slamming doors and cars revving by and all kinds of um, loud noises, you know? <laughs> And I just decided to go with it, so I apologize if there's some sounds that are um, a little bit disruptive, but I feel like it kind of illustrates the point, so why not? In this video, I'm talking to Carrie Hugens. She's based out of Austin, Texas, and I first came into contact with her when she joined the Quarantine Artist Postcard Exchange that I organized back in 2020 and 2021, and she sent me this lovely one, and I it's just charming. I love it. I love the way that uh, she rendered it and just the composition and her use of color. And it brought a smile to my face when I got it in the mail in the middle of a very isolating time. And she's been on my radar to talk to for a while. And so I was really happy that I finally got to know her a little bit better. After recording this, I went to her opening at a show in Lockhart and we got to meet in person, which was really cool. This project has been so rewarding for me on a lot of kind of subtle, deep layers. But um, I think one of the most important things is that I just get to have conversations with really cool people. And sometimes I feel like I'm making a new friend. And I definitely felt that way with Carrie. She's an extremely insightful person. And the title of this, A Small Voice in a Big Conversation, was her turn of phrase that I just really loved and found very helpful in the context of what we were talking about. I feel like people often equate having a quiet or a small voice with weakness or failure, but I find that actually to be opposite of the truth most of the time. I think it takes a lot of strength to maintain a level of restraint and calm and centeredness in an environment that is often screaming at us and that seemingly calls for louder and louder and uh, more and more assertiveness you know, leaning into aggressiveness in order to just get attention and to, to just step back from all of that, I think is really powerful. I have definitely found that to be the case in talking with Carrie. We go into some topics that I don't always feel comfortable talking to people about. And I really think that that was significant that I was able to go there with her and, um, definitely really appreciate that. Carrie's work has an element of beauty and calm to it that I think is easy to probably overlook in the climate that we live in, but there's so much more to it. And I'm going to let that reveal itself to you as the conversation unfolds. But I hope that you enjoy getting to know Carrie as much as I did. And I want to say that I really appreciate also the community that is starting to build up around these videos. And so thanks to you for being a part of that and for watching. And here we go. One of the things that you've been doing that has caught my eye is the flowers. I don't know if it's UV light or how, like how an insect would see a flower or... There's been quite a few of those and that playing with the senses that are outside of human perception because our our senses are just like very narrow, but there's just like so much more out there is something that um, I've played with that a little bit in my work and I'm attracted to that. And do you mind talking about that body of work? Yeah. So, well, a couple of years ago, I started growing like a pollinator garden. Uh-huh. And then during the quarantine, I just turned my whole backyard into like a sunflower field. And so then I started getting more into gardening. And I, between then and now, I discovered that the, the way animals see flowers, there's just a whole range of colors that we're not perceiving with like UV light. Yeah. And then because technology has become so far advanced, like you can buy UV light off Amazon. 
and you can wander around taking pictures at nighttime of things like on a, a new moon when it's really dark. So I started, I started painting them. So you're taking pictures with a UV light and like with your phone or just like, a yeah, camera? my phone. Yeah. yeah. Like, on a tri like on a tripod with like a uh -huh. UV light and then painting. That's really cool. And then there's a, like, that brings this question in my mind too, that like what we're seeing is sort of a representation of that with the aid of a tool, like how accurate is it to what an insect sees? Like, have you looked into that or am I totally complicating it? <laughs> no, I mean, I've, I've tried to look into like, like the British and the Guardian, they've written a couple articles about bioluminescence yeah. and they've started to discover that like, even like squirrels will like, it's kind of gross, but they'll take their urine and rub it on their stomach uh -huh. and under UV light. It's bright red. So they're like communicating with each other in these ways that it's just not included to us. And then with, yeah. flower, with flowers, I was really interested because I guess from what I've read, bees see the flowers and the flowers that have a lot of pollen and are super vibrant, like they really glow under mm -hmm. UV light. And so I don't know, I just started... I just started really getting into the idea that like, because I enjoy painting flowers, is fun way to paint them in a different perspective. Like it's yeah. the same blue bonnet, but like it's this whole shade of colors that I didn't know a blue bonnet had. What do you feel like draws you to the mystery or opening awareness around the fact that there's all this other stuff that we can't see, but it's been there all along? Yeah. Is that kind of a more or like a broader interest for you or do you, is it specific to this, to this body of work? I, I like the idea that people should see themselves as like stewards on the planet and taking care of nature. I've tried with like the small plot of land that we own with our house to turn it into like a habitat for all the pollinators around me. Because if I start thinking about climate change too much, I get, um, like very dystopian feelings. Yeah. So in this way, um, partnered with like, I have like kind of a parallel tract of like yoga and meditation. Like I lived at a yoga retreat center for a year mm -hmm. and practiced karma yoga. I meditate every day. I have this whole sort of like other interest in like mystery schools mm -hmm. and figuring out how to change my consciousness in that way. So sort of like in parallel, it was the more that I meditate, the more that I start to see my life and the world around me differently. And then discovering that I could look at plants also in a different way. I was kind of like, what's that term when you follow your excitement? You're like, oh, what happens yeah. here? Like, I want to explore this. That's basically sort of how I try to operate is follow the curiosity mm -hmm. and, um, and I have a whole like follow the rabbit philosophy of life where I just sort of allow myself to be led in a way yeah that makes sense like I'm I'm obviously not going to go somewhere that feels off and wrong but like if it if it clicks and feels good then I'm just gonna like let that let it take me somewhere and it's taken me to some really cool insane places that I wouldn't have gotten to experience otherwise so I get that yeah that makes sense to me yeah I feel like that a lot of people during the pandemic had similar experiences with nature I know Renee and I talked about that in in our conversation and just like the sense of peacefulness and connection that you got from mm -hmm. being in nature and plants um for me it was trees like specifically it seems like that has been a common thread that i've been seeing with people like a lot more work that's being created that's nature centric and like focused on the sensory experience of it as well like and that includes like what we're talking about of like the stuff that's kind of right outside of our sensory experience I see a lot of uh, a lot of that out there people doing it in different ways um and I, yeah I just I think that's that's always cool when that happens like you tap into a little vein yeah that a, a lot of us exploring similar ideas yeah you just got back from Mexico is that right yeah yeah Guadalajara okay and you did a residency there well um 
years ago, well, last year I went to uh, Ceramic Osuro okay. for a few days and painted on some ceramic stuff. And I'm hoping to turn it into a longer residency. And then about two years ago, I did a residency in Mexico City, but I was able to bring my husband and daughter with me. So that was a lot of fun. But we go to Guadalajara often because um, my husband's all of his family, they live down there. I don't remember where on one of your posts somewhere, like you had talked about that you spent a lot of your childhood in Mexico too, right? I did. Yeah. About like seven and a half years. Okay. Of like the grade school years. Uh -huh. we're, we're in Mexico. Yeah. Where in Mexico was it? Uh, Mexico city and then Monterrey, okay. Mexico. So do you go often? Yeah. Well, um, and we moved to Texas about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so I've been going to Mexico uh, more and more often. And in the past year, it's been like four or five times a year. I know that Mexico City has like an amazing art scene. Um, do you have a lot of connections there and, and participate in all of that? Or what's your relationship to the art scene there? I have friends that are curators and we message back and forth. Mm -hmm. um, but to date, they're just like, come and apply for another residency. Uh -huh. Yeah. Which yeah. is, I have, I have a 10 year old, so it's a, it's a bit harder to figure out. Um, right. Like I can't leave a 10 year old for six weeks. Yeah. It's kind of, I think that's a symptom of residencies that I've, I've, I've actually never done a residency, you know, like residencies require people to give their time. I mean, it's the gift of time, but you also have to make space for that mm -hmm. when you have jobs and families. And, um, you know, if you're, if you don't have another adult living in the house, then you've got to find someone to take care of the house or pets or whatever. It's like, it's a significant, um, mm -hmm you know, task to coordinate all that. And sometimes there's like a, a big, ref like financial responsibility on top of that too. Um, that if you're lucky and you get a residency with like a really good, um, what's the word for that? A, a lot of them, it's not really enough to cover. Yeah. Like all, the time that you have to take off of work and all that. And they're so, they're so competitive. They like are. Like the ones that are fully covered, like it's like thousands and thousands of people apply. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's like the second tier where you get a studio and curators and classes and things, but then you're generally paying a bit out of pocket. Yeah. And then and then there's the third tier, which is just kind of like a hotel for artists where you're just paying for time to be left alone and have a meal made once a day. It's a weird, like, um, I kind of struggle with that. I mean, in my like daydream ideal world, like somewhere in the not so distant future, like I have a nice little plot of land somewhere and I can set up a little spot for people to come and, mm. and have a, an informal residency. Just like, I don't want to spend my time managing that but like mm -hmm. here's I have a space like if you want to come mm -hmm. come yeah um but like I I also really struggle in a way with the um like like the way this whole system is set up to where it it it's it's a big ask I think sometimes to you know for people who like in the art world, like artists are not, um, you know, usually making a lot of money from their yeah. art yeah. and having to have another job on the side. And, um, you know, it's not impossible to, to do that, but it's like, it's a, it's a field where people are already like not in a position financially to just usually be able to pick up and go and do things. And, um, in the same way that that maybe other people can but the whole system is sort of structured in a way that that's almost like required mm -hmm. in order to um advance your career in certain ways you know yeah yeah <laughs> like um I just yeah I I I, I have a real like 
discomfort. I'll just use the word discomfort with that. Um, but again, I've never actually done a residency, so I, I can't speak to like how the benefits outweigh any of that. Well, the one I did in Mexico city was like the sort of second tier one mm -hmm. where I was like applied and got in and then I had to pay a fee that, but that included like a nice house and like studio space. And then also access to like curators and field trips. And yeah. I was able to bring my husband and daughter with me. Um, and having, I was living, having, being able to expose my daughter to Mexico City was, it was important to me to be like, this is where I lived when I was your age. But it wasn't the, I had me, I had a great time, but it, it wasn't the kind where it's like, here's a $10,000 check. Right. Come, <laughs> come, you genius. Right. <laughs> make, make your masterpiece. I wish there was more of those. Yeah. <laughs> yeah really um it's, from the outside looking in it's like wow yeah wonderful. yeah I mean I really like I guess I should start looking at some of that stuff I've had people a lot of people tell me I need to um be doing that but um I I look at some every now and then and it has to have it has to have like like the, just all the right ingredients, I think, for me to to apply, which also there's usually a fee to apply yeah. or there often is. And um, so it's kind of like if I'm going to invest, if I'm going to invest my money and then invest my time and further money, it's got to like it's got to be the right one. Right. And so I've been extremely picky I guess and part of that is because you know I don't have I my financial resources are limited so I'm putting them where it matters oh, yeah you know yeah 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 but um yeah it's a weird it's a weird s side effect of all of the the some you know the art world so what are you, you're working on getting ready for the show in Lockhart and mm -hmm. I've been seeing you post like some grid paintings. Yeah. Is that what you're working on right now or? Yeah. But yeah, the show will be a, a lot of my grid paintings, which are kind of like data art, if that makes sense. Like uh -huh. it's colors and stories and feelings from books I'm reading or life events. Like uh, my, my father-in-law recently passed from cancer. Mm -hmm. So there's just sort of different things I metabolize into these yeah. data paintings. And then they're just kind of aesthetically satisfying. Also, like the way they land with all the different colors. Yeah. So um, I kind of explore that in parallel to like painting. I really enjoy painting. I know it's cliche to paint flowers, but I really enjoy painting flowers. I mean, I, I kind of feel like we're in this era where people should just do what they want to do. I mean, it's like, you know, if you're going to look at art history, we've sort of tested the waters of like, what's a, what are artists allowed to do? And there's certainly like, you know, there's a lot of work being made that's like about what's going on in the world and people's and identity and politics and like social stuff like that. And, and all of that is, is valid and relevant and important. Mm -hmm. But there's all this other stuff too. And that's also valid and important and meaningful. And um, I just like my whole, my whole take on art is that it's like a window into the world through another person and how they experience it. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, the, you know, I hate to say it's the artist's job or whatever, because like, do what you want. But yeah. like, in a way, it's like, that's the role of the artist is just to be a reflector of how they experience the world. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, just being true to like, what, what, you know, is going on for you. And, um, and that's going to be different for everyone. So I feel like, I mean, again, we already talked about the fact that like, there's a lot of people who are doing nature based Yes, art right art now thing. and that yeah. you had tapped into a vein of that and so I mean there's definitely a long history of like trivializing artwork that's that's like flowers 
or landscapes or, Mm -hmm. you know, anything that's like too pretty. Um, But that's also kind of nonsense. Yeah. (laughs) And also based in like toxic patriarchy probably too. So yeah. Yeah. I, Um, I, I was thinking like the idea of like scientific materialism you know yeah. the idea that like, we've yeah. turned over all, everything to thinking science can solve all of our problems yeah I, th- I feel like I don't know there's there's like a whole other group of sensory experiences that we're denying ourselves by being so um convinced that science can solve it for us yeah I had seen you post something about that I think on threads and um and you use that term scientific materialism, which I lo- I was excited about because I don't think that that's a term that's really widely out there yet. Like it's, it's starting to be more, but I know I've said that to people and they're just like, what are you talking about? Have to kind of explain like what materialism versus material being materialistic. Yeah. You know? Like it's, that's not the same thing. Yeah. I mean, all that, like it ties back into your, what we were talking about earlier with the, the UV light paintings and the, the narrow range of human senses. Yeah. Uh, yeah it's like, I, I was reading somewhere, somebody made the point that they're like, like radio waves were always out there. We just found them eventually. Right. So that's kind of, you know, I, I like, I like that. Like kind yeah. of liminal space sort of explorations that yeah like the plants were all obviously beautiful under uv light we just didn't have it and then we did have it but only at universities but now you can just buy uv lights on amazon and wander right. around and be like oh my god yeah um and i honestly hadn't even i have a little flashlight and i hadn't even thought of like pointing it at plants i'm just like no. looking for scorpions with it while i'm camping yeah. so you know yeah. Totally. <laughs> yeah, that's that's um that's a really good point that like the technology is just sort of like becoming more widely available and dispersed. And so people are having firsthand experiences with it mm-hmm. in a way that they haven't in the past. Um and yet, like you were just saying, um whether or not like you know, there's just some things that at least at this time, the, the, the tools that we have and the science that we have can't go there can't yet. Go there. Yeah. And maybe it never will be able to, you know, yeah. it could yeah. just be a limitation of our little narrow frame of existence, you know? Yeah. I've had lucid dreams my whole life. There's like no real explanation for it. Yeah. It's just like a thing that happens. All yeah. of a sudden you're in a dream and you're like, I don't want to be here anymore. That's cool. It's I do that every now and then get to a, a lucid point. Um, but I do I do like enjoy working with my dreams, you know, and um like before I get out of bed, kind of sitting with them, laying there and replaying them. I can't grab it right now, but I'm reading the tibetan book of dream yoga Uh uh-huh and that it's about um working with your dreams yeah to have more lucid dreams and to have more control over it but they're talking about um how there's kind of like a spectrum of lucid dreams like ones where you're just kind of like vaguely aware yeah all, all the way to like the masters who are like you know having really conscious explorations of yeah like deep meditative states and their lucid dreams that's cool yeah mm-hmm. I mean I'm in, I'm very I'm very into all of that stuff I mean I th- think a lot of the work that I do is about I mean I'm going to use the word extrasensory mm-hmm. loosely just because I feel like um I feel like we don't quite have the vocabulary yet to talk about a lot of these things and when you say things like e- extra sensory it automatically like has this whole slew of associations that aren't quite right yeah but I don't really know what words to always use so um 
you know, sensing, sensing things that obviously are not there in real life, you can't touch them mm -hmm. or whatever, but they also, um, act as kind of like communication or that's the rabbit that I'm following, you know? Yeah. Yeah. The intuition. Yeah. It's whispering. It's, yeah. Um, like stop look around right and it comes in in a lot of different ways like visual visual or more like you know like words or whatever but um yeah yeah I get that yeah like, it's like voices that are like Carrie yeah <laughs> pay attention to what you're looking at right now and then slow down I'm like whoa yeah that's great really? I mean, I really liked your, um, I was looking through your Instagram, your nighttime photography. Oh, thank you. I just, I mean, I love the night sky. I grew up being able to see the Milky Way and like, it's a source of sadness to me that we've created a world where we can no longer see the stars. Oh yeah. You know? And all the impacts that that has on nature too, like the bird, like the animals and how they've had to adapt all of their rhythms. Like it's a huge yeah. thing, yeah. but, yeah. um, and it messes with our circadian rhythm. Yeah. And then we're all just spending too much money on like lighting the entire city. Yeah. I went looking for a children's book the other day that doesn't exist. My daughter likes to read um, like myth stories about the night sky or different gods. Uh -huh. and I was hoping to find one because we have like Norse gods, Greek gods, Roman gods. We have got her a book on Egyptian. But I was really hoping to find one about like the different origin stories of the Milky Way. Yeah. That, that that book doesn't, as far as I can tell, it doesn't exist yet. Because yeah. there's just so many different stories about like, from different cultures of like, what is the Milky Way? Well, we think, you know, the other Milky Way is, anytime we can get out to West Texas, it's just, yeah, it just blows my mind. It's like, I it's, know, it's like a living chapel above you. I You're know. Like, <laughs> I mean, I feel like we're really lucky to have, I mean, it's a, it's still a, a day's drive from here, yeah. but like, we're very lucky to have a dark sky designated area mm -hmm. that's that accessible to us. Um, I mean, I would totally live out there if I could figure out the logistics of that. Yeah. <laughs> but right now my life is not structured in a way that that's really feasible yeah um I mean not just for the night sky just uh, like all of it the the landscape out there and mm -hmm. just the, the feel of it I love it whenever we go just we try to go like once a year so it's not as often as I'd mm -hmm. like but um I find it to be just very deeply refreshing yeah it's something about the expansiveness and the quiet and like the little bugs and the snakes yeah it's, it's I feel all of it recharged yeah, I'm a big rock person and just like the rocks and the giant crystal pockets yeah. under the ground and there's a vibration and a frequency to it mm -hmm. and it's like you can feel it. I feel like that place, um, it, it will give you what you need and what you don't know that you need. And sometimes yeah. that's a challenge, like sometimes it will definitely um, task you, mm -hmm. you know. And, um, I mean, I've, I'm a big camper and I've had some times out there where I just was like beaten, <laughs> beaten, like nature almost won, you yeah. know, and I'm careful and I'm, um, well-practiced. Like I've taken my survival skills training and all of that, but, um, it's it's a very unforgiving place yeah if one thing goes wrong and then just that heat yeah can heat really yeah we had um what's that state park out there there well there's big ben ranch state park there's davis mountains no um the Guad guadalupe okay yeah the guadalupe mountains is yeah yeah that's a national park we, we camped there once 10 years ago and had car problems so we were stuck there longer than yeah. we wanted to be Oh my God. Like scuttling from shade to shade. Yeah. During that two day period, I felt like a lizard. It's, yeah. It's time to like, <laughs> time to shift again. Yeah. It's, it can be brutal. Yeah. I was out there. Um, I think it was 2022 in May and 
May's already hot out there, but it was already like it was unseasonably like already 108. Mm. And I wasn't quite expecting that. And I my car, like it's a pretty reliable car, but it um because it was so hot, I mm-hmm. did I mean I wasn't like getting out and hiking and stuff. I just did a a driving tour, like a day long driving tour through Big Bend National Park. And um, there was a part where you're you're going up on some switchbacks and um, and my car just died. Like it just had had enough of 108 degrees and like, yeah, you know, climbing, climbing and yeah. the AC blasting. And um, yeah. so it died in the middle of the road on this hill and which is like, you know, all yeah. kinds of things can go wrong there. Yeah. And somebody came luckily that there's enough people in that park that like somebody came and um helped me out and followed me um out of the park until I got you know to safety but just just dealing with that Mm -hmm. in the sun like I just I mean it took it it was like I felt it for a couple of days you know Mm -hmm. of like probably getting pretty close to um like heat you exhaustion. Know, heat exhaustion and but it's so like the rewards are so amazing. Yeah. You know, it's so worth it. Um, yeah. When we were there, like getting up at dawn and doing yoga, it was like, yeah. this is the best. Yeah. Absolutely. But then I spent the day like scuttling from shade to shade. Yeah. Like all the animals do. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. how you do it. I mean, like, like we were saying earlier, it's kind of like art being that window that allows you to see the world through another person's experience and perspective. And then that acts as a mirror for you mm-hmm. and how you see and experience the world. Um, I mean, that's a, like a lot of my work is inspired by that area, you mm-hmm. know? or, Mm -hmm. or it's inspired by experiences that I've had while I've been there, you know, um, that feel very magical and expansive. There's especially like 2020, 2021, like when the, I mean, the world is still insanely intense. It's very intense. A lot of stuff going on. Um, but that time period in particular felt like for the work that I was doing, because it wasn't like directly focused on some of that stuff that it needed to be a little quieter Mm -hmm. and in the background to allow space, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. that was something that I was kind of aware of and also not aware of. It's become something that I've been more conscious of, I guess, in the years since then, Mm -hmm. knowing that there's wars going on and all this other stuff. And I'm like doing artwork about extrasensory experiences and landscapes and you know whatever and and um and like kind of me sort of coming to to terms with like where where am I with all of that Mm -hmm. um do you feel like is that something that you have in your mind as well like um where your work fits into to all of that and to what's going on in the world and how, like, how do you, um, I mean, I guess for, I I guess the, I'm trying to figure out exactly what my question is here, but, um, I think what, what it is for me is that there's a sense of like, I've had to come to a a place of like, yeah, Lisa, it's okay. (laughs) Yeah. This is your world and it's okay. Like you're not, bypassing that stuff in in life like outside of your artwork but it's okay for you to focus on this area you know yeah um do you feel like there's been any of that for you or yeah is that just me (laughs) no I mean um like growing up and until I was about 30 uh my dad was an American diplomat Mm -hmm. so I felt like at the dinner table, like my whole life, like just constantly bombarded and informed about current events. And like, I lived in South Africa as a kid before and after the apartheid. 
like I lived in Mexico, like there was an assassination, like I lived some like high, like I always had this like high awareness of like cultural events happening in that kind of way. And it, it really wasn't until I became a mom and in my 30s that I started to feel like I needed to figure out how to integrate all these different cultural identities. And then mm -hmm. I needed to like give myself permission to like make art that was like just maybe a small voice in a big conversation, you know? Yeah. Because like, I don't know, I just didn't know how to integrate all of that for the longest time. Yeah. And I feel like I'm talking about kind of that human liminal space experience that a lot of people tap into and have that kind of like meditative experience. And in my flower paintings, you know, nature is my keyboard, I guess. That's what I'm, the tools that I'm using to communicate. Um, but I feel like it's okay to be like, I can't solve all of these different problems, but maybe if somebody comes across my painting, they'll be able to take a couple deep breaths for five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> and, and go on yeah. with their day. Right. And that's an okay contribution to make. That's an, like, in that's pile an actually of chaos that's happening. In an the amazingly world. important contribution, I think, that we forget. I like the way you said that, like, it's a quiet voice mm -hmm. in all of that. Um, because I think there's so much pressure to sort of, uh, like in American culture and, and even in like the art world to just like really be louder and be like be the art star be like yeah. the celebrity and the you know that like that like the quiet voices are often overlooked and sometimes dismissed mm -hmm. but um but there there's there is a really like deep value in mm -hmm. that breath and that moment of stillness that allows people um either the people who are inclined to be a little more um visible uh -huh. and 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 like out in the world um or like people who heard or like you said more introspective and like um I think yeah I think it's just like everybody need it's like that you can't breathe it out without breathing in or however mm -hmm. I may have flipped that saying yeah, yeah. um like that in breath is really 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 important mm -hmm. um thank you for that like that that was helpful for me to like kind of um I mean it's it is it's it's something that I I'm at peace with but I also do still wrestle with it a, a little bit I think you know there's a sense of of like a desire to try to create a better world and mm -hmm. um and and there's so much like out there going on that it can be overwhelming and how and when and oh yeah you know, what's the best way to do that so yeah it can be really overwhelming yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah contemporary society can be very overwhelming yeah to try to have a silver lining like I do feel like that I see more people making choices to like to do things in their life that are for them and that make them happy and that aren't like you know people are seeing that the way um things have been structured don't don't work or they're not yeah. equitable or 
you know, whatever it is. And so, um, so why do things in that old way? Yeah. Those paradigms don't, they don't work. Yeah. Like perfect word. Like it's a very paradigm shifting kind of time that we're living in. Mm -hmm. And I think it's easy to like, um, to look at all of that stuff and get really disheartened. Yeah. But to like reframing it as like, we are shifting paradigms right now and it's, it is hard work. Yeah. But, um, but also it's, you know, it's moving in a direction that, yeah. um, is hopeful. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's important. Yeah. Work. And if, I don't know, <laughs> sometimes I have this fantasy and I'm like, I don't know that maybe so many of us being trapped at home will maybe spark something like a greater consciousness for something in 20 years from now it'll finally bear fruit yeah but um that's my that's the hopeful version there's also other yeah. times where my brain goes down like you know yeah dark dystopian holes too yeah i try to hold on to the long term hope that i mean i feel like just the conversations have just shifted and not just in what people are talking about, but how people are talking period, like whatever it is they're talking about. I mean, the, just the fact that you and I had, have just had a conversation where we're talking about um, like liminal spaces and extrasensory stuff. And like, I'm going to put that on YouTube. Yeah. You know, like yeah. for people to see. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I don't think that like, I wasn't there five years ago. I mean, I was still, I was already doing work and, and having these experiences and, and focusing on that, but I was yeah. not talking about it. Like publicly talking. Yeah. yeah. Not the same way. Yeah, and I, yeah. and I wasn't seeing other people do that. And that's part of why, like, um, it didn't feel like there was a space for it. Yeah. And coming from a, like a background where like that had been sort of stamped on mm -hmm. more than once, like there was a reluctance to. And so yeah. like, but now people are talking about that kind of stuff. Yeah. And that's only one example. Like there's all kinds of um, like you could apply the same thing to a lot of different um, topics that, that are people are working with, like just the, com the conversations are changing, you know? Yeah. Yeah, um, I had um I had a meditation teacher who was like, look, it's like a hundred years ago, if you wanted to learn how to meditate, you had to like figure out a way to get yourself halfway around the world and then ingratiate yourself to like an ashram, like yeah, beg begging them to take you on. And then they had to kind of like put you through some sort of like character tests to see if over a number of years if they were worth teaching you. And now maybe it's not like the most sophisticated versions of meditation, but like, it's, it's very accessible, like all over the world, you know, like, yeah, like that's a, an optimistic sort of like, you see it in like your end of your yoga classes at the YMCA. They're like, yeah, take a couple, you know, I think it's a natural human thing to turn in internally. In word. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it, it, in the West, it was, that was like very, very effectively, um, I've squashed, pushed, pushed to the side. Know? And so we haven't had the cultural, um, like framework for accessing that. And it's been also frowned on and even people have been like punished in various ways for, for that. But so, you know, we've had to like, look to other cultures to remind us and to mm -hmm. teach us like yeah. how to do that. But it, I don't, oh, I don't personally feel that it, it has to be attached to like a specific set of like cultural practices in order for people to access that for themselves, you know, yeah. it's like, that is a, that's a doorway. And if that's a doorway that works for someone like, great. Mm -hmm. but, um, 
but yeah, it is like, it's, it's just more, um, accessible, uh, culturally. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know? That's what I mean. Like people are just curious, you know, they're just yeah. like cur- curious. It doesn't, I don't know, you know, and like in yoga, they're like the idea of a guru is dead, you know? Yeah. It's, kind of, it's, it's the idea that like, you need to have like the motivation and the desire and the practice, and then you'll just one foot in front of the other. Right. To figure out how to cultivate that space. Yeah. And the idea that like, um, cut, like kind of cutting out the middleman, like the, a guru is a middleman like yeah. between this, this space and an individual Yeah, really the whole thing is that the individual is that space like it's one and the same yeah yeah need the middleman whether it's a guru or like a a religious figure or whatever um it's personal that is um very similar to how i tend to think you posted about the book the spiritual I can't think of the title right now. Oh, yes. I need, it's on my list of books to buy. I definitely <laughs> recommend that. It's kind of an older book. It's mostly in black and white. It's more text than images. So it's like the total opposite of the way that people create art books now. Yeah, which is yeah. more images. images. And I've read pieces of it, but I haven't read all of it, certainly. But it's just like a really good overview mm-hmm. of like art that has has gone into like the spiritual Mm -hmm. and that that's another word that I've had to sort of wrestle with in my life because I I always associated it with religion growing up but I've had to sort of detach it into being more about like a lot of the stuff that you and I have just talked about Mm -hmm. Um, and so it's really cool to see just like who like what other artists have been kind of working in that that space you know um and how like across time it's it's like a little bit different but then there's like a current that goes through all of it yeah Um, yeah Uh, i think i'll um i'll bump it farther up the list yeah this feels like Um, one of those signs like (laughs) carrie yeah i was um my friend scott winterode that i did the talk with him he's the watercolorist Oh yeah. I watched that one. Yeah. He actually, um, gave me that book like about probably 10 years ago now. And he had kept like, he kept telling me like, I think you'll really like this book. And at that point I was very much like the word spiritual. I was just like, I don't know. Like, I don't know. Like that's not my world. And, um, and you know, part of that, like I grew up in rural Texas and, and the, conservative religious aspect of Texas was a, a big part of my, mm-hmm. my community mm-hmm. that felt very, um, constraining. I'll just say that like yeah. it felt constraining. And so the rest of my life was very much about like, how can I turn away from, from mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. constraint? Mm-hmm. And, um, and so that association that I had with the word spiritual, like just connecting the dots in my head back to like that world. And it's Mm -hmm. just, it's something entirely different. Yeah. Yeah. No. Um, Yeah. Cause sometimes it feels like certain words are owned by different people. You can't use it because you're like that word's owned by them. Yeah. better word to use so you just have to that's kind of what I was getting at earlier with like I don't think we have quite the vocabulary yet to talk about a lot of this stuff because there are so many um like strong associations um with certain words and like I do readings for people I don't use the word psychic ever because Uh psychic like people have very strong expectations about like what you're going to tell them yeah um but um but in some ways like that is a part of what I'm doing it's just not in the way that people have like thought of that word Mm -hmm. and yet like the word intuitive is a little too soft yeah 
yeah, I just, I just, I don't know. Like, I don't think we're, we're there. And that's part of like all of these like paradigm shifting things that we're experiencing, like in, in all the, like in everything, you know, whether it's like economic stuff or, um, woo woo stuff or like yeah. whatever yeah it is like it has it's in everything yeah we're we're ripe for change yeah yeah <laughs> there's so many um, things that i'm like what just from like doctor's appointments to the way schools are run there's constantly confronted in society today with just like these knots that you're like really like that's yeah that's the best system that's been created for this yeah <laughs> okay yeah it's so true god it's yeah it really is it's just like in all the little things like in everyday life where mm -hmm. you're just like this is not working no. and it never really did yeah you know? so why did we why did we accept it for so long yeah yeah or why haven't you know why haven't we kept demanding change? I always feel grateful when I have another person in my life that I can talk to you openly about oh. all this stuff that we've talked about today. And so I really appreciate that. Um, I feel like that's that circle of people is growing for me, but there, there was a very, very long time when it just, I didn't really have anyone, like maybe one other person that I could talk to about all that stuff yeah. without yeah. people just being like, okay, you're a weirdo. Yes. Um, so I've had, I've, I've had a lifetime of that experience. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you being like, all right, Carrie. Right. Let's, let's steer it back to the yeah topic yeah. of the sports game. Or Instead of like being curious about it, like, well, that's weird, but tell me more, you know? Yeah. Um, so I really appreciate that. I've enjoyed watching the videos of your other interviews. Thank you. Oh, I felt like, all right, I can, <laughs> yeah, this is an environment I can walk into. Good. I'm really glad to hear that. Yeah. I mean, it's great. I mean, it's really generous of you to offer your time. Yeah. To, thank you. To interview yeah. an artist about like what they're up to. I'm trying to approach it from like, well, like, what do, what do, what am I interested in? What am I, what do I want to watch? And I want to, I want to watch artists being real people mm -hmm. talking about like their, what they're doing, but also contextualizing that in their life. And like, if it goes off in a totally another direction, that's not even related to art, then that's cool too. Yeah. You know, cause it's all connected. Yeah, it is like the whole life whole person yeah like you know talking about meditation it's part of it it's part of who you are yeah and so it's part of what you're making and that's I mean I I do think there's a lot of more and more people who are becoming interested in meditation and so even just like you and I talking about it for a little bit might give someone either the permission or like uh, just like the awareness of of how this person approaches it like there's yeah. different ways and I don't so know many, so yeah. many different ways like yeah sometimes when I stare at flowers and I'm painting them I kind of get into a trance you know you're just like everything else sort of falls away you know yeah. or some people when they go hiking it's very quiet you know yeah that's Cook me cooking some people there's mm -hmm. so many different ways to like sort of drop into that it's kind of a weird way to say drop in because it's also like a sort of higher consciousness state yeah I don't know. Maybe you have to go down the stairs to go up the elevator. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's exactly how I like the plain air work that I do, mm -hmm. which like stylistically is so totally different than a lot of the other stuff that I do, but that's what it is. It's like mm -hmm. a form of meditation. And yeah, yeah. for me that like it's internal, but it's also the whatever natural thing is that I'm drawing you know mm -hmm. and surrounded with so it's yeah. like the plants the animals like the air temperature like, a, like all of it yeah like emerging like emerging field. experience yeah I feel like that has become so critical like integral to just me kind of keeping staying grounded and like keeping a sense of like internal um, balance and and peace 
that yeah. allows me to then like be in the world and do right. other stuff. Yeah, to show up for the chaos. Yeah, but exactly. like stay more even in it. Yeah. yeah, and it also is like they're real messy looking. It's like wet on wet watercolor, and it's oh I, yeah, like it's very very rapidly rendered. Um, mm -hmm. But okay, yeah, All it's right. like um, I feel like it's it it has like kept my drawing chops you know, like in yeah. practice. So <laughs> yeah. Um, Cause it's real easy to get rusty. It's you know? very easy to get rusty yeah. in the drawing. Like yeah. I don't know. sometimes I flip through old portfolios and I'm like, what a great portrait I did. And I sit down to try and do a portrait and I'm like, whoa. Yeah. Drawing a nose. You're right. Not how to draw a nose. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, that sounds like a really lovely practice. It, it is. And uh, I, I feel like I talk about it a lot in these videos, but uh, um, it is because it's so integral to everything else. Like the other stuff that I, I do that is more like it's intuitive, but it's also very like there's a lot of like intellectual processes going on mm -hmm. a lot of like mind I, I think of it as like it's a bat like that plain air stuff is totally it's just energetic mm -hmm. meditative and then the other stuff is like I take that and then I start like mentally processing around all that you know mm -hmm. um and then the style is totally different because yeah. of that. it's just like different different aspects are being activated and so um I love that no I was in I did east well, I've only done east once and I know we call it, it's called something else now the Austin studio tour um and I had I had different um like parts of my practice in different areas of the house because I kind of felt like I wanted to show like a little bit of everything because it all feeds into itself mm -hmm. but um I had quite a few people come through that day that were like oh I thought this was a totally different person nice. you know yeah. <laughs> and I was like yeah I I mean I I get it I understand yeah and um a but couple of, a couple of those people very clearly told me they thought that was a weakness that I should not be doing that I should just be oh. doing that style but that's whatever yeah. you know yeah um but I like, I like that idea like that you're have different arenas that you're making art in yeah I just like I think that's good I think it's good it works for me like yeah I couldn't do one without the other yeah yeah you know? and um it is like I I do have a like tendency I will get very very in my head you mm -hmm. know, and, and to the point where I get so in my head that I won't, I can't, I will, I can't make anything, mm -hmm. you know, because I'm just like planning it, planning it, planning it, and then replanning mm -hmm. it and then like judging it. And, you know, yeah, yeah. And that yeah. plain air stuff has helped me to like, to balance that, mm -hmm. you know, um, and, and because it can be completely messy and, uh, loose and like, there's no, like, there's no conceptual mm -hmm. element to it. Yeah. So there's like a freedom there, but I like, yeah. I like, I mean, I have a little bit of a sheepdog thing going on in my brain. So like, I, I need to organize stuff and yeah. Yeah. Um, it like breaks up the ruminating. Cycles. Yeah. Yeah. And brings you back to just like the creative energy. Right. That's like spontaneous. I, I can't like only do that because then yeah. my, my sheepdog brain would be like, come on, we got to organize some stuff. And like, yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah, I think that creative energy that's like spontaneous, yeah. like I see yeah. this thing, let's try and draw it. Right. Yeah. yeah. That sounds like a really good way to, you know, like a con conversation inside your own art of like, yeah. Things. Yeah. Sometimes I go over here on this adventure. Sometimes I go over here on this adventure. It's been an evolution to like get to the point where I recognize that that's what was happening. 
and to not like because there was a there was a a while you know at the beginning when I was feeling myself like doing this thing and then this totally thing this thing that felt very different and separate and like just kind of like which thing am I doing like what am mm -hmm. I doing and mm -hmm. uh, and I just kind of decided to not worry about it and to do whichever thing I felt drawn to in the moment yeah and they, it's just has evolved to where they still visually look very different mm -hmm. um but 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 I know that they're totally yeah. connected yeah yeah so I mean, it's, it's the same hands yeah it's sort of maybe pro projects running in parallel somehow yeah I feel like the whole thing of an artist having one style is also a symptom of the the art world that we have in place right now that's very much focused on like selling. Yeah. You know, it's easier to sell work when people know what to expect. Yeah. You know, so if, and if you're going to be like, well, I just decided to explore a new style today. Yeah. <laughs> and a totally new direction. Yeah. Um. Like I, I get it, but I think that is creatively stifling. Yeah. I've never, I mean, I mean, I sell work from time to time, but I've never, I have friends who've managed to make that leap in the yeah. world, but that's never been my path. Yeah. I haven't, I haven't gotten there myself. I mean, I don't show really either. And it's part of that's the same thing about like what I was talking about with the, um, the residencies where it's kind of like, I have my pool of re financial resources and so I'm going to put them where I think it's going to matter for me most yeah yeah the most and a term. lot of like getting into shows you have to oh, have I hate to that pay yeah. a fee to be considered yeah. and um I think it's so predatory sometimes it is and I just like I um I've chosen so far like I've done a little bit of it and 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 I've been like gotten into some things, but for the most part, like that whole exercise of me paying a fee to submit my work to be considered for a show has just reinforced that I just feel like at least up until now and probably going a little forward into the future still, like I'm okay with just, um, just doing the work. Yeah. And I'd like for it to be shown, like, especially the, the series that I've done, like, I'd love for them to be shown in their entirety. And because I can't, like, you know, I made a major life change. Like, I studied art in school. That was my degree. But then I went into publishing. And um, I had kind of a falling out with art <laughs> and the it art happens. world. But then I just missed it. And mm -hmm. I started doing it again. And it yep. became a compulsion. And it was a big, huge life change, you know, to cut, pivot from one area to the other. And so I think taking that time, you know, to just do the work has been yeah. important for me because of that, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, Plus, sometimes society is so snobby about the word artist. Yeah. You know, I'm like, oh God. <laughs> yeah. Society gets so weird about stuff like that. It does. It's very academically focused too, you yeah. know, that, um, and there's a benefit to that. Like, yeah. but also I think that it, it can, um, it can detach from that your creative spark mm -hmm. that exists in everybody, including yeah. people who, I mean, that's why we have folk art. Yeah. I don't always know why we have to differentiate between like the work that people who are considered folk artists are doing and the people who have been like academically trained as artists mm -hmm. and are, like functioning in this like traditional art world mm -hmm. setting. Yeah when it's the same creative spark that's yeah. at the bottom of all of it, you know? Yeah, they had started their different journeys. That's yeah. another area I do feel like, you know, is ripe for some paradigm shifting. Yeah. I've taken some classes online with artists. That's kind of far out. It's cool too, because that's another income source for artists, you know, yeah. that is, um, it's adjacent to their artwork it's not yeah. like you you have to ha go out and have like I mean maybe probably also there's another job but it's like you yeah. can 
gradually restructure things so that you have hopefully income sources that are um, like varied, but still all sort of related. And yeah, there's a lot of options out there for people to explore. I mean, that's part of why I wanted to to do this on YouTube is because I do see it. It's like, there is that potential, you mm -hmm. know, that it can grow and, and possibly even become monetized at some point as like, as like yeah. a, a piece of the pie. But I do think that like, it is important for artists to have kind of a diverse, um, like a diversified portfolio of their, <laughs> yeah, their existence, of their artistic income, you know, yeah. Uh, because you're not going to always be selling paintings, you know, yeah. and like, maybe you're in the middle of working on paintings and it might take you a year or two years or whatever it takes. Yeah, yeah. And so in between there, there's gotta be other stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, okay. yeah. Cause there's the daily grind of existence <laughs> Yeah. every day. Yeah. And it's not so like, it's not just for for that though, like it's really, I just feel like YouTube in particular is a totally untapped um, opportunity for artists, you know, cause it's visual. Mm -hmm, like there, mm -hmm. There's a lot of art podcasts, but whenever I listen to them, I'm always like, but I want to see the work. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and there That's are true. like, there are people, there are artists on YouTube, but um there aren't enough. Yeah. We and haven't... there's not a ver enough of a variety yet, I think, on the kinds of like content that people are producing. Yeah. And I don't, I wouldn't want to encourage people to like, again, like force something and do something that doesn't feel right for them and like mm -hmm. is taking away from their practice or whatever. But it's like, if someone was inclined and wanted to try it, you know <laughs> yeah no that's true um, 